I'm Annie Fisher, the Vice President of the American Literary Translators Association. I'm excited to open this video commemorating the longlist, shortlist, and winner of the 2020 National Translation Award in prose. 2020 marks the 22nd year for the NTA and the sixth year that the award is conferred separately in poetry and prose. The NTA is the only award in the United States to include a rigorous examination of the long-listed translations against the originals. We are grateful for the crucial work of our anonymous expert readers. Welcome everyone. We are excited to have you here to celebrate with us. The judges for the 2020 NTA in prose are Amaya Gabancho, Emmanuel Harris, and William Hutchins, who judged nearly 240 titles this year to select the longlist, shortlist, and winner who will receive a $2,500 prize. We will be hearing from Emmanuel Harris with the blurbs for the shortlisted titles, and then we will go to Amaya Gabancho for the announcement of the winner of the 2020 National Translation Award in Prose, followed by a brief conversation and reading with the winner. Please feel free to follow along in the awards brochure found in the description, and we encourage you to purchase these titles from the bookshop.org page also found in the description. When you do, you support local bookstores. Engage with us in the comments, wherever you're watching, and tag us at Lit Translate on Twitter and use the hashtag Alta43. And now I'll turn over to our judges. And here are the 2020 National Translation Award in prose shortlisted titles. Beyond Babylon by Ijaba Shegu, translated from Italian by Aaron Robertson, Two Lines Press. Beyond Babylon is a polyphonic, transoceanic, fragmented family epic spanning three continents with the Mediterranean Sea at its core. The blue mass that defines the Somali-Italian relationship, the Mari Nostrum, both a grave and a passage to hope. Through half-sisters Mar and Zura, Ijaba Shego explores the history of Italian colonialism and the uneven power relations that define it. It's a story of migration and identity of the so-called marginal condition. Marginal through race, gender, religion, and language. It is also a great Italian novel in the biggest sense of the word. Aaron Robertson navigates the polyglottic nature of the text wonderfully, letting the rhythms of Italian and the sounds of Somali, Arabic, and American swim across this strand of the translation. The Chef, a Cook's Novel, by Marie Indaye, translated from French by Jordan Stump, Alfred A. Knopf. The translator informs us that chef, C-H-E-F-F-E, -E, is a new word in French, meaning a female chef. The novel by French Senegalese Indaye deftly parlays the language of culinary delight with the subtleties of nonverbal communication between a businesswoman and her challenging daughter. The enchanting text that results and covers the histories behind an otherwise very public chef and her personal realities. A Couple of Soles, a comic play from 17th century China by Li Yu, translated from Chinese by Jin Shen and Robert E. Hegel, Columbia University Press. In translating this delightful 17th century Chinese romp, Jin Shen and Robert E. Hegel have used their meticulous scholarship to create a lively comedy in which a young scholar and a young actress outwit her parents and corrupt government officials. The translator's critical apparatus is as thorough as it is unobtrusive. God's Wife by Amanda Michaelopoulou, translated from Greek by Patricia Felicia Barbeto, Darkly Archive Press. Amanda Michaelopoulou's God's Wife is a metaphysical, philosophical, postmodern novel. The question of existence is key to it. Writing and the idea of bringing oneself into being are built and deconstructed in a narrative that examines notions of love, creation, femininity, and faith. Like Penelope, God's Wife can only make and unmake, weave and unweave, and in the process, make right herself. Patricia Felicia Barbeto definitely reflects Michaelopoulou's evocative prose and playful wandering moods. Optic Nerve by Maria Gainza, translated from Spanish by Thomas Bunstead, Catapult. This engaging work from Argentina provides a self-portrait of the first person narrator through an analysis of her interactions with quite different works of art. The translator achieves a narrative intensity that does not drag or become pretentious. Zulaika by Gusiel Yahina, 
translated from Russian by Lisa C. Hayden, One World. The harsh and desolate land of Soviet area Siberia forms the backdrop of Yahina's first novel, an ambitious narrative capturing the strength of the human spirit. Zuleika discovers the means to survive an abusive husband and a cruel mother-in-law in a story wrought with imagery and discovery. Haydn's powerful yet sensitive translation incorporates songs and legends from Russia and Tartar sayings into a seamlessly captivating epic tale. What at first glance appears geographically distant becomes intimate, relatable, and in many ways triumphant. And the winner of this of this year's National Translation Award in Prose is The Chef by Marie Ndiaye, translated from French by Jordan Stump and published by Alfred A. Knopf. And now I would like to invite Jordan to join me on the stage, so to speak, in this virtual stage. Hello, Jordan, and congratulations. Thank you very much, Amaya. How are you? I'm good. I'm very good. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> I'm delighted and thrilled and uh, et cetera. But uh, apart from that, fine. <laughs> well, we love your translation. We Thank love you. your book. And this is a very special novel. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to translate it? There's a very long version of that story, uh, but essentially I've been, I've been a fan of Marine Diaz since the early 1990s. Uh, and it took me a long time uh, to sort of get around to translating her. That was uh, uh, sort of in the early 2000s, I guess, I started translating her. After a few false starts, I, I, I tried and I hated what I did, and so I just gave up. And then I tried again, eventually found a publisher for something that I'd done, uh, the wonderful uh, Two Lines Press. They asked me to do more, um, and, but those were sort of Ndiaye's uh, slightly older books. Her more recent books were being translated uh, by others than me and published by Knopf. And so when La Divine came out a couple of years ago, I, I found an old connection who I thought would be able to get me into, uh, to, to get me um, connected to somebody at Knopf and they did and I begged and pleaded to let them let to let me please translate that novel and they did uh, and then when this one came out I went back to them again I said there's another in Yaya I begged and pleaded and uh, and they were actually a little hesitant because this is a, just an, as you say an unusual novel uh, but in the end they did and so the rest is not quite history but it's how that book got published and the world is a better place for it. Well, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> just a tiny little bit. Better, uh, just a tiny right? bit. <laughs> we love the book, uh, All of Us Three Judges. And uh, what we remarked upon was uh, the style of the book and, and um, how you navigated those tensions within the language. Um, because it seems, at least it seems to me, that the lead character, the chef, is this sort of unknown entity and we only get a version of her through the narrator who you know is at times adoring of her and at times you know he hates her and he has this you know um, complicated relationship with the character so we get this version of the character and at the same time while there is this kind of sense of the character being withheld because she only exists behind this other narrator and we don't quite understand whether this narrator hates or loves her or what, you know, he loves her obviously, but there's also something else that's kind of like a little bit of a mystery. And, and so I wanted to ask, you know, how did you navigate this, this tension within the language, which is very compellingly, you know, uh, 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 written in your translation, this tension that is inherent to the story, but also I think inherent to the language. Yeah, thanks, it's a really good question. I mean, to me, the, I have a boring answer for all questions of this sort, which is that the only thing that works for me uh, is to keep rethinking what you're doing all the time. Uh, I do a first draft, I do a second draft, I do a third draft, I go back, I compare it to the original, I, try, I revise backwards. Very importantly, I get my wife to read in, out loud while I, the translation out loud while I follow along in French. Um, there is this continual, but no matter what translation you're doing, uh, there's this continual balance that you have to strike between 
um, the, the words that you have to deal with, the words that are available to you and the words that are available to the text. And you've got to be continually rethinking those words and then also rethinking the person who's speaking them. In this case, it's easier in a way because there's one person. He's a, he's a mysterious person, but there is only one person. And so you can sort of imagine who is this person, who is this strange person who has this obsession uh, uh, with the chef and then is first doesn't tell us all sorts of interesting things and then slowly later they come out. Um, and so you, you get to, you, you with, a, with a really constant revisiting and diving back into the translation and the text, you can slowly, hopefully, find some way to work it out so that the, the words of the, two, um, of the two narrations can somehow be made congruent. But as any translator knows, that's a nice thought. 95% um, of the time, it's not working, right? Well, you made it work in this book. Uh, thank you. It's really thank you. good. I you. What's your next project? Let me see. Um, actually, coming out this fall, I have another Ndiaye book uh, that time of year, and then also a book by Scholastic uh, Mukasonga, a Rwandan writer who I've been translating. Um, I uh, also have been working actually with a colleague of mine. Um, she's doing the editing and I'm doing the translating of a collection of uh, fairy tales written by women uh, in France in the early 18th century. So that's a change for me. Wonderful. And um, uh, also working on a novel by uh, by Eric Chaviard, uh, an old friend of mine, old favorite of mine, and uh, an older book. Um, I'm looking actually for a new for a new project. Uh, so and I want my new project to be some somebody I haven't translated before. Maybe hopefully somebody who's never been translated. That's my dream. Although if if another Njaya book comes out, I will leap on it. That's, she's, I have to make an exception for her. That's wonderful. And uh, the next thing that I want to ask you is, I want to ask you if you would please read us a little passage from the book. So this is, uh, this is about the chef's love of cooking and her, her feeling inhabited by the spirit of cooking and what happens when that spirit isn't inhabiting you. Mm -hmm. When you didn't feel it, or when you felt it but found no pleasure in it, and looked on the dismembered animals, the dirt-crusted vegetables, everything hiding the secret of its tastes and waiting gravely, unhelpfully, for you to figure out what to do with it, then an enormous weariness and nausea might, 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 wake you, might make you wish you could just run away, the chef said, and never again feel yourself bound up with that dead, stinking flesh, the entrails, the fat, the tedious labors, the inevitable filth, and the pain of all those, human and animal, by way of whom an ineloquent, mindless food made its way from kitchen to table, the animal's shrieks, the human's exhaustion. You wanted to run away as far as you could when that monotonous misery hit you full force, when the cool ecstasy of creation wasn't protecting you, said the chef with her little oblique smile. And sometimes I did, and I thought I was freeing myself, but of course I always came back, said the chef, because I was even unhappier freed from the trials of cooking than enduring them, and I didn't often have to endure them, whereas when I was far away from them, I suffered all the time. No two ways about that. I could never be happy for long outside my kitchen, the chef used to say, and then added quickly and dutifully, except with my daughter, and we both knew it wasn't true, or at least I did just as I knew the chef felt obliged to invent and to trumpet a joyful motherhood, motherhood, not for herself, not out of pride, but in hopes of convincing her daughter, wherever she was, she was never with her, as if such words repeated year after year might in the end impregnate the air her daughter was breathing someplace in this world and disarm her forgetful but rancorous heart, her heart that preserved no memory of the love she'd been given, but kept rigorous track of every perceived slight. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, so much. We Thank are you so much. That you are the recipient of this award this year. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to your next translation. All right. Thank you.